the 26th Sunday after Trinity, well, God, whose blessed Son was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil and make us sons of God, heirs of eternal life. Grant us, we beseech thee, that having this hope, we may purify ourselves, even as he is pure, that when he shall appear again with power and great glory, we may be light, made like unto him in his eternal and glorious kingdom. Where with thee, O Father, and thee, O Holy Ghost, he liveth and reigneth, ever one God. Amen. Amen. Verse 5 of Lent 148. So Lent for a while. Teach us to know and love you, Lord. Humbly follow in your way. Speak to our souls the quickening word and turn our darkness into day. Well, we return to Werner George Kummel, and I, last time I was at this, I was laughing my head off uh, as he assured us of his scientific approach, which was a price of the book moment, as I remember, mentioned it, that he can't approach the New Testament in a dogma or creedal approach. Um, he's been liberated from all that, so we'll see where he goes. Um, it was kind of funny, you know, so, but let's settle down and try to be serious here. Um, pick up here. The first to raise this question was the canon, was the great exegete and critic origin, 185 to 254. And he did so concerning the letter to the Hebrews. In doing so, he made spe special use of the style. The character of the diction of the epistle entitled to the epistles has not the apostle's rudeness in speech, who confessed himself rude in speech, 2 Corinthians 11.6. That is in style, but that the epistle is better Greek in the framing of its diction, will be admitted by everyone who is able to discern differences in style. <clears throat> but again, on the other hand, that, uh, that the thoughts of the epistle are admirable, and not inferior to the acknowledged writings of the Apostle. To this, everyone will consent as true who has given attention to the reading of the Epistle. But as for myself, if I were to state my opinion, I should say that the thoughts are the Apostles, but not the style and composition belong to one who called to mind the Apostles' teaching, and as it were, paraphrases of what his Master said. If any church, therefore, holds this epistle as Paul's, let it be commended for this also. For not without reason have the men of old time handed it down as Paul's. But who wrote the epistle? In truth, God knows. Yet the account which has reached us is twofold. Some saying that Clement, who was the bishop of the Romans, wrote the epistle. Others that it was Luke who wrote the Gospels and Acts. As the passage quoted above makes evident, Origen clearly recognizes the impossibility. No, he doesn't, on stylistic grounds. No, that's not what he said, uh, George Vern. We're going to call him Vern. Nevertheless, since many churches hold a contrary opinion, he does not draw any equivocal conclusions. It was otherwise with his student Dionysius of Alexandria, Bishop 247-65. to 65. Both stressing the linguistic and stylistic differences between Revelation and the other Jehannine writings, and by demonstrating the altogether different manner by which their respective authors characterize themselves, Dionysius furnished completely convincing proof that the Revelation to John could not have been written by the author of the Gospel and the letters of John. Consequently, that unlike these latter, it is not apostolic in origin. It is true that in advancing this proof, Dionysius was motivated by considerations of church politics. By excluding revelation from the canon, he hoped to undermine the biblical support for an apocalyptic heresy, chiliasm. Nonetheless, the fact remains he remained he advanced a genuine historical argument, and in doing so, asserted more than his teacher. 
kind of allowed that he uses the word historical criticism. Some is this is he gonna looks like he's is he quoting here? He says Dionysius. A footnote looks like it. Some indeed of those before our time rejected and altogether impugned the book, picking it to pieces chapter by chapter and declaring it to be unintelligible and illogical and its title false. For they say it is not John's, no, nor yet an apocalypse unveiling, since it is veiled by its heavy, thick curtain of unintelligibility. That the author of this book was not only not one of the apostles, or even one of the saints, or those belonging to the church, but Corinthus, the same who created the sect Corinthian, C E R, not C O R, after him, since he desired to affix to his own forgery a name worthy of credit. <coughs> but for my part, I should not dare reject the books any brethren hold it in estimation, but reckoning that my perception is inadequate to form an opinion on it. I hold that the interpretation of each several passage is in some way hidden and more wonderful than appears on the surface. For even though I do not understand it, yet I suspect that some deeper meaning underlies the words. For I do not mean measure and judge these things by my own reasoning, but assigning to faith the greater value. I've come to the conclusion that they are too high for my comprehension, and I do not reject what I have not understood, but I rather wonder that I did not indeed see them. After completing the whole, one might say, of his prophecy, the prophet calls blessed are those who observe it, and indeed himself also, for he says, Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book, and I, John, that he saw and heard these things, Revelation 22, 7 and 8. That, then, is certainly named John, and this book is by one John, I will not gainsay, for I fully allow that it is the work of some holy and inspired person, but I should not readily agree he was the apostle, the son of Zebedee, the brother of James, whose are the gospel entitled according to John and the Catholic epistle. For I form my judgment from the character of each and from the nature of the language and from what is known as the general construction of the book, that the John therein mentioned is not the same. For the evangelist nowhere adds his name nor yet proclaims himself throughout either the gospel or the epistles. John nowhere mentions his own name, either in the first or third person. But he who wrote the apocalypse at the very beginning puts himself forward. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which he gave him to show unto his servants quickly. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and his testimony even of all things that he saw. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia, grace to you. The evangelist did not write his name even at the beginning of the Catholic epistle, but without anything superfluous began with the mystery itself of the divine revelation, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our own eyes. Nay, not even in the second and third extant epistles of John, although they are short, is John set forth by name. But he is written the elder without giving his name. This writer did not consider it sufficient, having once mentioned his name to narrate what follows, but he takes it up again. I, John, your brother, and partaker with you of the tribulation, kingdom, and patience of Jesus was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Moreover, at the close, he speaks thus, Blessed is he that keepeth the words of the prophecy of this book, and I, John, he that saw and heard these things. That the writer of these words, therefore, was John, must, must, one must believe since he says it. 
of what John is not clear. For he did not say that he was, as is frequently said in the gospel, the disciple loved by the Lord, nor he which leaned back on his breast, nor the brother of James, nor the eyewitness and hearer of the Lord. For he would have mentioned some, one of the aforesaid epithets, that he wished to make himself clearly known. And he makes use of none of them, but speaks of himself as our brother and partaker with us and a witness of Jesus, and blessed in seeing and hearing the revelations. I hold that there have been many persons of the same name as John the Apostle, for who for, who for the love they bore him, and because they admired and esteemed him and wished him to be as he was of the Lord, were glad to also take the same name after him. Just as Paul, and for that matter, Peter, too, is a common name among the boys of believing parents. So then there is also another John in the Acts of the Apostles, whose surname was Mark, whom Barnabas and Paul took with themselves, Acts 12.25, concerning whom also the scripture says again, and they had also John as their attendant, but as it were, was the writer, I should say, no. For it is written that he did not arrive in Asia with them, but having set sail. Scripture says from Paphos, Paul and his company came to Pergam, Pamphylia, and John departed from them and returned to Jerusalem. But I think there was a certain other John among those who were in Asia, since it is said that both there were two tombs at Ephesus, that, and that each of the two is said to be John's. Apart from the conceptions, too, and from the ideas in word order, one might naturally assume that this writer was a different person from the other. There, there is indeed a mutual agreement between the gospel and the epistle, and they begin alike. One says, in the beginning was the word. The other says, that was from the beginning. The one says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory. The other, the same words slightly change that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our own eyes, that which we beheld, and our hands handled concerning the word of flesh and the life manifested. But these words he employs as a prelude since he was aiming, as he shows in what follows, as those who are asserting that the Lord has not come in the flesh. Therefore he was careful also to add, and that which we have seen, we bear witness and declare unto you the life, the eternal life, which was the Father and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard and declare unto you. He is consistent with himself and does not depart from what he has proposed, but proceeds throughout under the same main ideas and expressions, certain of which we shall mention concisely. But the attentive reader will frequently, in one or the other, life, light, turning from darkness, the truth, grace, the joy, the flesh, the blood of the Lord, the judgment, forgiveness of sins, the love of God, the commandment that we should love one another, keep all the commandments, conviction of the world, the devil, antichrist, the promise of the Holy Ghost, the adoption, um, faith, Father, Son, for these are to be found everywhere. In a word, it is obvious that those who observe their character throughout will see at a glance that the gospel and epistle are inseparably in complete agreement. But the apocalypse is utterly different from and foreign to these writings. It has no connection, no affinity in any way with them. It is scarcely, so to speak, has even a syllable in common with them. Nay more, neither does the epistle, not to speak of the gospel, contain any mention or reference to the apocalypse or the apocalypse of the epistle. Whereas Paul in his epistles gives us a little light on his revelations, which he did not record in a separate document. And further, by means of the style, one can estimate the difference between the gospel and epistle and the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. The revelation are, for the former are not only written in faultless Greek, 
but also show the greatest literary skill in their diction, reasonings, and constructions in which they're expressed. There's a complete absence of any barber's word or solecism or vulgarism, whatever. For their author had, as it seems, both kinds of word by the free gift of the Lord, the word of knowledge and the word of speech. But I will not deny that the other writer who had seen revelations and received knowledge and prophecy. Nevertheless, I observe his style and that his use of Greek language is not accurate, but that he employs uncultivated idioms in some places committing downright solecisms. These there is no necessity to single out now, for I have not said these things in mockery, let no one think it but merely to establish the dissimilarity in their writings. A question of the apostolic authorship of a few New Testament writings that were finally canonized continued to be discussed in the ancient church until the beginning of the fifth century, but nowhere treated again more methodically, methodical clarity of Origen or Dionysius. Furthermore, the ancient church and the medieval church, for that matter, ceased to pursue historical inquiry. Nevertheless, Eusebius, who died in 339, the father of church history, <clears throat> in addition to the remarks of Dionysius that have been quoted, preserved numerous other accounts of disputes about the authorship of a few New Testament writing accounts that became familiar to the medieval church by way of the Latin translation of his ecclesiastical history. And somewhat later, Jerome, the great compiler of the Latin church, in his list of authors entitled Lives of Illustrious Men, an essay heavily indebted to Eusebius, noted in his catalog of several apostles, which of the writings credited to them had been disputed by many Christians the great authority of Jerome was such that at least the fact was known into the Middle Ages that the question of the authorship of a few New Testament writings had been one that was debated. St. Peter wrote the two epistles which are called Catholic, the second of which on account of its difference from the first in style is considered by many not to be him then to the gospel according to Mark, who was his disciple and interpreter is ascribed to him. James wrote a single epistle, which is reckoned among the seven Catholic epistles. And even this is claimed by some to have been issued by someone under his name and gradually as time went on to have gained authority. Jude, the brother of James, left the short epistle, which is reckoned among the seven Catholic epistles, because in it he quotes from the apocryphal book of Enoch. It's rejected by many. Nevertheless, by age and use, it has gained authority and is reckoned among the Holy Scriptures. The epistle, which is called the epistle of, to the Hebrews, is not considered Paul's on account of the difference from others in style and language, but it is reckoned either according to Tertullian to be the work of Barnabas or according to others by the Luke evangelist or Clement, who they say arranged and adorned the ideas of Paul in his own language. Though to be sure, since Paul was writing to the Hebrews and was in disrepute among them, he may have omitted his name from the salutation on this account. He, being a Hebrew, wrote Hebrew, that is, in his own tongue and most fluently, while the things which were written well in Hebrew were even more eloquently turned into Greek. And this is the reason why it seems to differ from the epistles of Paul. John the Apostle, whom Jesus loved, wrote also one epistle which begins as follows, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our own eyes at our own hands, handled concerning the word of life, which is esteemed by all men who are interested in the church or learning. 
the other two, on which the first is the elder to the elect lady and her children, and the other, the elder unto Gaius, beloved whom I love in the truth, are said to be the work of John the Presbyter, to the memory of whom another sepulchre is shown at Ephesus to the present day. As we've noted above, the Middle Ages had some knowledge of the historical questioning of the New Testament writings on the part of the ancient church. And the prologues to the Bible manuscripts also handed on some information about the conditions under which the writings came into being. However, because the New Testament, like the Bible as a whole, was regarded as part of the ecclesiastical tradition, the question of the conditions and origin and historical peculiarity of the individual writings of the New Testament could not come under scrutiny until the end of the Middle Ages. And in this respect, humanism made no essential change. It is, of course, that the Vulgate ecclesiastical sanctioned Latin translation of the New Testament was subjected to criticism by such humanists as Laurentius Valia and Desideramus, Desiderius, Desiderius Erasmus, and not only Erasmus, but also Cardinal Cajetan, the man who, as papal legate, tried to compel Luther to recant at the Diet of Augsburg in 1518. They were stimulated by Jerome to renew the ancient church's critical assessment of the writings that were disputed in antiquity. Nevertheless, the interest in sources that was manifested in all this, the greater emphasis laid by the ancient church on criticism as compared with the Middle Ages. I hope he's going to include uh, Thomas Cranmer's confutation of unwritten verities to show what they all thought of the historic canon. We'll see. See, Vern. In the end, Erasmus declared himself ready to submit to the judgment of the church or to contradict his own. And in the fourth decree of the Council of Trent, 1547, expressly condemned Cajetan's views with the consequence that they could no longer be represented within the confines of the Catholic Church. Well, now we're turning to the period of the Reformation, and then he's going to switch to textual criticism in part two. What's he doing in this first part? He's kind of giving a history, a prehistory, ancient and medieval part two. Prehistory, ancient and medieval to period of the Reformation. And then part, big part two is the stimulus to change, the scientific age. <clears throat> Let's see as we have seen, humanism was unable to call a genuinely historical criticism of the New Testament into being within the framework of the Catholic Church. However, in connection with the theology of the Reformation, three fundamental observations were to be made, though not to be though to be sure the revolutionary consequences for New Testament research did not at first become apparent. In the first place, we draw attention. Remember, this guy's from Marburg. He's a disciple of Debellius and disciple of, uh, what's his name? Our friend, Rudolf Boltman. Who, who was it who said we, oh, it was Prophet George Ernst Wright? He said we just throw him overboard without our argument. It was about what I do, although I've already I studied Bolton heavily. Alas. First place, we draw attention to the basic recognition of the Reformers that it is not the Church and not the Pope who can determine the sense of Holy Scripture, but that Holy Scripture is the only and final source of revelation for Christians, and that consequently Scripture is to be explained by Scripture itself. During the altercation with Cajetan and Eck at the Diet of Visa, Augsburg and at the debate of Leipzig, Martin Luther, in the course of disputing the authority of the councils, reached the conviction that only 
scripture could impart the truth of God and in a form that was to have worldwide historical consequences he articulated this insight insight at the end of his address in defense of himself at the Diet of Worms 1521 and repeated it still later in the confession published in 1538 the small articles the Holy Scriptures must needs be clearer, easier of interpretation, and more certain than any other scriptures, for all teachers prove their statements by them, as by clearer and more stable writings, and wish their own writings to be established and explained by them. But no one can ever prove a dark saying by one that is still darker. Therefore necessity compels us to run to the Bible with all the writings of the doctors to get our verdict and judgment upon them. For scripture alone is the overlord and master of all writings and doctrines on earth. If not, what are the scriptures good for? Let us reject them and be satisfied with human books and teachers. Here I answered, since then your serene majesty and your lordship seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner, neither horned nor toothed, unless I am convinced by the testimony of scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known they have often heard and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. A deed or word of the Holy Fathers cannot be made an article of the faith. Otherwise, whatever of food, clothes, houses, etc., they would have to become an article of faith as it happened with their relics. It is the word of God that is to determine article of faith. Nothing else, not even an angel. Okay, so he's obviously, he's doing a setup here. Uh, this is all prehistoric. <laughs> Welcome to Marburg. Vern. Lent 149. Eternal Lord of love, behold your church walking once more the pilgrim way of Lent. Led by your cloud from the day, by night your fire. Moved by your love and toward your presence bent. Far off yet here, the goal of all desire. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. World without end. Amen. Godspeed.